In 2019, the audience's relationship with the Joker was pretty firmly established. Mark Hamill had given an amazing vocal performance in the animated series, Heath Ledger had managed to outshine Jack Nicholson in cinema, and Jared Leto painfully reminded us that just because something is new, it doesn't automatically make it better. And that's why Todd Phillips' Joker raised a few eyebrows before its release. Is this an origin story, a prequel, a loner movie, or all of the above? As the script itself acknowledges, it's not really about the Joker so much as a Joker. It stated, This story takes place in its own universe. It has no connection to any of the DC films that have come before it. Taking on a character that has already been defined and subsequently redefined is an uphill battle. If you do the same thing, you're a copycat. If you do something classic, you'll be criticised for playing it too safe. Which is why, at the age of 43, Joaquin Phoenix didn't even attempt to build on what any other actor had contributed to the character. He planned to show us something unique. Joker was hailed as an instant classic that captured a real feeling at a certain time in history. A sense that things were spinning out of control. And whether you liked the movie or not, it's hard to deny that Phoenix delivered an unforgettable performance from start to finish. There's simply nothing else quite like it. On paper and in execution, there are thousands of ways this portrayal could have gone wrong. Joaquin is in every single scene, so there was nowhere to hide, but somehow he pulled it off and earned an Oscar for his efforts. Now, normally in my videos, I lay out three keys to what makes a performance work so well. But upon reviewing Joker, an overarching reason that the character is still empathetic, despite his heinous acts, is because he possesses contrasting personality traits. Phoenix isn't just showing us one thing again and again. He's showing us two opposing sides to one individual battling their way to the surface. When the audience witness these wild swings between both extremes, their impression of the character is muddled, as when you're pulled hard in two directions, you tend to land somewhere in the middle. So I think framing each key as a conflict makes the most sense, because it's the layers Phoenix shows us in each scene that makes the performance whole. So the three keys are weighed down versus free, laughing versus crying, and childish innocence versus deranged anger. Let's start with Weighed Down vs. Free. This speaks to the physicality of the performance. On top of losing over 50 pounds for the role, Phoenix gives Arthur Fleck a unique walk, a restricted way of carrying himself. You can see he's physically weighed down, as if he can feel the forces of the world restraining him. Arms tightly grinding by his side, face pointed south, a limp in his step from being beaten up. We can tell from his walk alone that he's wounded, tired, that he has no confidence, that every day is a slog. This even translates over to his unusual run. It's as if Phoenix has weights in his shoes, the loud clattering with each step. He's going as fast as he can, but it's as if he's battling against more gravity than the rest of us. He also looks like a man who's never been taught how to run, which is a strange thing to say, but speaks to how neglected the character has been. As Arthur himself stated, For my whole life, I didn't know if I even really existed. By physically portraying the character like a chained victim, this inherently makes the audience want him to be freed. Which is why Arthur's other side, his Joker side, is a lot more physically free, Loose limbs, joyful expressions, in tune with a song no one else can hear. A man who seems in control of his own destiny. Phoenix stated that a big influence for his performance was actor Ray Bulger tap dancing in the old soft shoe, obsessively watching this video from 1957 again and again. What's interesting is that some of the movie's most iconic scenes are Arthur discovering this free side to himself in the form of dance. But when I read Todd Phillips and Scott Silver's script, it appears as if the dance is somewhat improvised. The dancing starts in this scene after Arthur is given the gun by Randall, and we see this disturbing look on Joaquin's face before he accidentally fires it. But the script never mentioned any dancing, just that the 1937 version of Shall We Dance is playing on the TV. 
But Phoenix adds this internal process of Arthur being seduced into this other side of himself, and then improvises these lines. Hey Arthur, you're a really good dancer. I know. Which shows us that Arthur craves external validation from literally anyone. These are essential building blocks to the character that pay off once Arthur begins to get attention. After he kills the Wall Street bankers, the famous bathroom dance is also pretty minimally referenced in the script. Now of course director Todd Phillips had influence here too, but given each page of a script roughly translates to one minute of screen time, it seems Phoenix turned these throwaway lines into something much more significant, as the actual dancing lasts for 1 minute and 18 seconds. Notice how this freestyle of dancing is also very different to how Arthur performatively dances as a clown. One is used to pretend not to be miserable, and the other is used to seek actual joy. The next key is laughing versus crying. Joker takes the phrase, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, to a whole new level, as laughter is used as a way for Arthur to cover up his despair. It's usually when Arthur is challenged or conflicted that the laughter inappropriately explodes out of him. But Phoenix plays the laughter as a source of pain, an involuntary choking reflex like Gollum. <coughs> Director Todd Phillips showed Joaquin videos of people who suffer from what's known as the pseudo-bulbar effect, a real disorder characterized by episodes of sudden, uncontrollable, and inappropriate laughing or crying. <laughs> The first scene Phoenix shows us this disorder is in the social worker's office. <laughs> We're introduced to the sound of laughing, but if you play the scene silently, he looks like he's crying. This creates a jarring feeling for the audience. We're receiving contradictory pieces of information, hearing joy, but seeing misery. We don't know how to feel, so we just watch in discomfort. The script introduces Arthur with close on Arthur, 30s, tears in his eyes from laughing so hard. He's trying to get it under control, his greasy black hair hanging down over his forehead. Then later in the same scene, it describes, despite the laughter, there's real pain in his eyes, something broken in him, looks like he hasn't slept in days. But Phoenix brings far more to the table. He shows us a harrowing internal battle between laughing and crying through these quick little ticks on his face. Once one laugh stops, we can see the lips fighting the urge, trying to restrain another laugh. Meanwhile, if we just focus on his eyes, they seem at peace. Then they sort of smile along with the laughter, but then once a laugh sneaks out, they're replaced with sadness, as if he's depressed that he can't control himself. And then he lets out another huge laugh, this time looking trapped in agony throughout. Phoenix masters this consistent look of pain throughout each scene. It's an unrelenting internal tug of war. Even when things are going well, there's something eating away at him. So again, by showing the audience a wide emotional range in each scene, one side tormented, the other relieved, the audience will instinctively hope for the better side to win. So we want him to be free, not weighed down, and laughing instead of crying. And that brings us to the final key, childish innocence versus deranged anger. Phoenix portrays Arthur Fleck as a naive and innocent child. Despite being in his mid to late 30s, he doesn't talk or act like an adult. There's initially a harmlessness to Arthur. He performs for kids, curls up in bed next to his mother to watch TV, and even in his fantasies, he's just dreaming of being rewarded and appreciated for who he is, not dreaming of being someone else. Phoenix authentically sells us this tender, good-natured side to Arthur, a sense of genuine wonder and innocence in his eyes, just wanting a father figure, someone to support him, this is essential to keeping the audience on his side when the deranged anger starts to seep out. Arthur's anger is usually justified, but Phoenix shows us that the rage hits on a deeper level for someone that's already so emotionally imbalanced by never blinking. 
This wide-eyed, unbroken trance shows us that there's a monster bubbling underneath. The longer the eyes stay open, the closer and closer the monster comes to the surface. When Arthur's hero, Murray Franklin, makes fun of him on TV, Phoenix subtly shows us Arthur's heart breaking. Think of how a different actor might have played this, furrowed brows, shaking heads, maybe even throwing something in the room. But Phoenix plays it differently. He doesn't blink, he doesn't say anything, but his jaw and lip just very subtly tremble. So on the top half of his face, we see deranged anger forming through his stare. And on the bottom half, we see heartache processing. For a character so defined by his facial tics and involuntary laughter, the stillness and silence feels especially jarring, as if both sides that battle within him cease fire and come to an agreement. They're now on the same team against Murray. These long stares consistently precede Arthur taking physical action. He explodes with an uncontrollable wild violence, like some sort of hyena, so much adrenaline pumping that notice how Phoenix's whole body is physically vibrating and he needs time to recover. But after the first outburst, even in the midst of spiraling rage, Phoenix improvises this little fall before he curls up on the floor and cradles himself. This again shows us the contrast between innocent child and deranged lunatic. The performance is constantly walking this tightrope between victim and villain. Once you start to see too much of one side, you get a subtle reminder of the other. But it's the little details that are so impressive here. Even though Arthur suffers from involuntary laughter, notice how when it comes to Randall, a rude colleague he secretly loathes, he responds to his joke with a high-pitched fake laugh. I'm a dick, Gary. <laughs> Phoenix establishes its fake by stopping the laughter immediately once he's out of sight, <laughs> showing he's in control of it. Then later, when Randall and Gary visit him at home, in response to his cruel joke, he releases another fake laugh, <laughs> before violently lashing out. So now we subconsciously associate this high-pitched squeal of a laugh with preceding violence. When's the next time it resurfaces? On stage, right after Murray mocks him. And how's that going for you? <laughs> Followed by this detached little glance to Murray, eyeing his prey. All of these are subtle cues to the audience that something is wrong and danger is impending. Now for this final moment, let's look at how Phoenix builds on what's written in the script to enhance the scene's crescendo. The script simply reads, You're awful, Murray. There's no more laughter. The audience is watching this exchange with full attention. Murray responds, Me? How am I awful? Playing my video. Inviting me on the show. You just wanted to make fun of me. You're just like the rest of them, Murray. Everything comes too easy for you. But Phoenix takes his time with each line, and by doing so, gives himself the opportunity to offer us up a whole host of different emotions. Check this out. Playing my video. Inviting me on the show. You just wanted to make fun of me. Notice first the trembling mouth. We can see the rage roaring inside of him, barely able to contain itself. But it's also hurt. His heart is breaking all over again from Murray's betrayal. But it's also in his nose. His breathing is so enraged that he's purring like a cat. Meanwhile, his eyes are staring deep into De Niro's, squinting as he reveals he knows Murray's underhanded intentions. Is he angry? Yes, but he's also wounded, because notice how there's these little teardrops forming in his eyes before he takes action. So we have rage blasting out his nose and pain leaking out of his eyes, while his mouth battles between both conflicting emotions. Phoenix is still offering us vulnerability in a murder scene. And it makes sense, this is a huge moment for the character, confronting the man who he once saw as a father figure, who he now sees as everything wrong with the world. What's interesting about Joker is that it's structured like a coming of age movie, an innocent boy through finding a love interest, pursuing his dreams and stopping living with his mother, turns into a man. But rather than it being a hopeful story of letting go of your fears to make your life better, 
Each step is darker, more isolating, and morally corrupting. The truths he learns about the world aren't constructive, but the character still perceives the destruction around him as progress because of how miserable he was before. This is what was so controversial about the movie, that it makes violence and chaos seem like a goal in itself, because for Arthur, it still symbolised personal growth and liberation. Writer-director Todd Phillips deserves a huge amount of credit for pulling off this movie, but who else could deliver a performance like this? With virtually any other actor, you can easily imagine this movie falling apart. It's the little nuances Joaquin Phoenix brings to the table that make both the character sympathetic and the performance credible. He could have just played it as a struggling man who suffers from involuntary laughter, but by bringing such a wide range of competing emotions into each scene, the viewer is swinging so hard from one extreme to the other that they don't know what to feel. They just know they've laid witness to something they never anticipated, and now won't ever forget. If you enjoy content like this and want to see more of it, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, as it really does make a difference to how much content I can pump out. Or if you can't afford that, then simply like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment down below to help the algorithm do its thing.